Hello and welcome to more Greek mythology. Today we are looking at the myth, uh, Norse mythology that also took, that kind of connects to Greek mythology a little bit, but also the Norse mythology in and of itself. Part 7, the mythology of the Norsemen. Introduction to Norse mythology. The world of Norse mythology is a strange world. Asgard, the home of the gods, is unlike any other heaven men have dreamed of. No radiancy of joy is in it, no assurance of bliss. It is a grave and solemn place, over which hangs the thread of an inevitable doom. The gods know that a day will come when they will be destroyed, Sometimes they will meet their enemies and go down beneath them to defeat and death. Asgard will fall in ruins. The cause, the forces of good are fighting to defend against the forces of evil is hopeless. Nevertheless, the gods will fight for it in the end. Necessarily the same is true of humanity. If the gods are finally helpless before evil, men and women must be more so. The heroes and heroines of the early stories face disaster. They know they cannot save themselves, not by any courage or endurance or great deed. Even so, they do not yield. They die resisting. A brave death entitles them, at least the heroes, to a seat in Valhalla, one of the halls in Asgard. But, they t uh, but there too, they must look forward to final defeat and destruction. In the last battle between good and evil, they will fight on the side of the gods and die with them. This is the conception of life which underlies the Norse religion. As somber a conception as the mind of man has ever given birth to. <clears throat> the only sustaining support possible for the human spirit, the one pure, unsullied good men can hope to attain, is heroism. And heroism depends on lost causes. The hero can prove that he is only he is only by dying. The power of good is shown not by triumphantly conquering evil, but by continuing to resist evil while facing certain defeat. With uh, such an attitude toward life seems at first sight fatalistic, but actually the decrees of an inexorable fate played no more part in the Norseman's scheme of existence than predestination did in St. Paul's or in that of his militant Protestant followers, and for precisely the same reason. Although the Norse hero was doomed if he did not yield, he could choose between yielding or dying. The decision was in his own hands. Even more than that, a heroic death, like a martyr's death, is not a defeat, but a triumph. The hero in one of the Norse stories who laughs aloud while his foes cut his heart out of his living flesh shows himself superior to his conquerors. He says to them, in effect, You can do nothing to me because I do not care what you do. They kill him, but he, lies un he dies undefeated. This is stern stuff for humanity to live by, as stern in its totally different way as the Sermon on the Mount, but it the easy way has never in the long run commanded the allegiance of mankind. Like the early Christians, the Norsemen measured their life by heroic standards. The Christian, however, looked forward to a heaven of an eternal joy. 
The Norsemen did not. But it would appear that for unknown centuries, until the Christian missionaries came, heroism was enough. The poets of Norse mythology who saw that victory was possible in death and that courage was never defeated are the only spokesmen for the belief that the whole great Teutonic race, of which England is a part, and ourselves, though the first settlers in America, uh, through the first settlers in America, Everywhere else in Northwestern Europe, the early records, the traditions, the songs and stories were obliterated by the priest of Christianity who felt a bitter hatred for the paganism they had come to destroy. It is extraordinary how clean a sweep they were able to make. A few bits survived. Beowulf in England the Nibelungenlied in Germany, and some stray fragments here and there. But if it were not for the two Icelandic Eddas, we should know practically nothing of the religion which modded the race to which we belong. In Iceland, naturally by its position in the last northern country to be Christianized, the missionaries seem to have been gentler, or perhaps they had less influence. Latin did not drive Norse out as the literary tongue. The people still told the old stories in the common speech, and some of them were written down, although by whom or when we do not know. The oldest manuscript of the Elder Edda is dated at about 1300, 300 years after the Christians arrived, but the poems it is made up of are purely pagan and are judged by all scholars to be very old. The younger Edda, in prose, was written down by one Snorri Sturluson in the last part of the 12th century. The chief part of it is a technical treatise on how to write poetry, but it also contains some prehistoric mythological material which is not in the Elder Edda. The Elder Edda is much the more important of the two. It is made up of separate poems, often about the same story, but never connected with each other. The material for a great epic is there, as great as the Iliad, perhaps even greater, but no poet came to work it over as Homer did in the early stories which preceded the Iliad. There was no man of genius in the Northland to weld the poems into the whole and make it a thing of beauty and power. No one even to discard the crude and the commonplace and cut out the childish and wearisome repetitions. There are lists of names in the Edda which sometimes run on unbroken for pages. Nevertheless, the somber grandeur of the stories comes through in spite of the style. Perhaps no one should speak of the style who cannot read ancient Norse. But all the translations are so alike in being singularly awkward and involved that one cannot but suspect the original of being responsible, at least in part. The poets of the Elder Edda seem to have had conceptions greater than their skill to put them into words. Many of the stories are splendid. There are none to equal them in Greek mythology except those retold by the tragic poets. All the best northern tales are tragic, but men and women who go steadfastly forward to meet death often deliberately choose it, even plan it long beforehand. The only light in the darkness is heroism. 22. The Stories of Signy and Sigurd I have selected these two stories to tell because they seem to me to present better than any 
other, the Norse character in the Norse point of view. Sigurd is the most famous of Norse heroes. His story is largely that of the hero of the Nibelunginlid, Siegfried. He plays a uh, plays the chief part in the Volsungasaga, the Norse version of the German tale which Wagner's operas have made familiar. I have not gone to it, however, for my story, but to the Elder Edda, where the love and the death of Sigurd and Brynhild and Gudrun are the subject of a number of the poems. The sagas, all prose tales, are a later date. Signy's story is told only in the Volsunga saga. Signy was the daughter of Volsung, the sister of Sigmund. Her husband slew Volsung by treachery and captured his sons. One by one, he chained them at night to where the wolves would find them and devour them. When at last, who was Sigmund, when the last, who was Sigmund, was brought out and chained, Signy had devised a way to save him. She freed him, and the two took a vow to avenge their father and brothers. Signy determined that Sigmund should have one of their own blood to help him, and she visited him in disguise and spent three nights with him. He never knew who she was. When the boy who was born of their union was of an age to leave her, she sent him to Sigmund, and the two lived together until the lad, his name was Sinfiotli, was grown into uh, was grown to manhood. All this time, Signy was living with her husband, bearing him children, showing him nothing of the one burning desire in her heart to take vengeance upon him. The day for it came at last. Sigmund and uh, Sinfiotli surprised the household. They killed Signy's other children. They shut her husband in the house and set fire to it. Signy watched them with never a word. When all was done, she told them that they had gloriously avenged the dead and with that, she entered the burning dwelling and died there. Through the years, while she had waited, she had planned when she killed her husband to die with him. Clytemnestra uh, would fade beside her if there had been a Norse Aeschylus to write her story. The story of Siegfried is so familiar that that of his Norse prototype, Sigurd, can be briefly told. Brynhild, a Valkyrie, was disobeyed Odin and is punished by being put to sleep until some man shall wake her. She begs that he who comes to her shall be one whose heart knows no fear, and Odin surrounds her couch with flaming fire, which only a hero would brave. Sigurd, the son of Sigmund, does the deed. He forces his horse through the flames and awakens Brynhild, who gives herself to him joyfully because he has proved his valor in reaching her. Some days later, he leaves her in the same firing place. Sigurd goes to the home of Gilkungs, where he swears brotherhood with the king, Gunnar. Grimhild, Gunnar's mother, wants Sigurd for her daughter, Gudrun. 
and gives him a magic potion which makes him forget Brynhild. He marries Gudrun then, assuming through Grimhild's magic pow magical power the appearance of Gunnar, he rides through the flames again to win Brynhild for Gunnar, who is not hero enough to do this himself. Sigurd spends three nights there with her, but he places his sword between them in the bed. Brynhild goes with him to the Giukungs, where Sigurd takes his own shape again, but without Brynhild's knowledge. She marries Gunnar, believing that Sigurd was faithless to her, and Gunnar had ridden through the flames for her. In a quarrel with Gudrun, she learns the truth and she plans her revenge. She tells Gunnar that Sigurd broke his oath to him, that he really possessed her those three nights when he declared that his sword lay between them and that unless Gunnar kills Sigurd, she will leave him. Gunnar himself cannot kill Sigurd because of the oath of brotherhood he has sworn, but he persuades his younger brother to slay Sigurd in his sleep, and Gudrun wakes to find her husband's blood flowing all over. Then Brynhild laughed, only once with all her heart. When she heard the well of Gudrun, but although of this she brought about his death, she will not live when Sigurd is dead. She says to her husband, One alone of all I loved. I never had a changing heart. She tells him that Sigurd had not been false to his oath when he rode through the fiery ring to win her for Gunnar. In one bed together we slept, as if he had been my brother, ever with grief and all too long, are men and women born in the world. She kills herself, praying that her body shall be laid on the funeral pyre with Sigurds. Beside his body, Gudrun sits in silence. She cannot speak, she cannot weep. They fear that her heart will break unless she can find relief, and one by one the women tell her of their own grief. The bitterest pain each had ever borne. Husband, daughters, sisters, brothers, one says all were taken from me and still I live. Yet for her grief Gudrun could not weep. So hard was her heart by the hero's body. My seven sons fell in the southern land, another says, and my husband too, all laid in battle. I decked with my own hands the body for the grave. One half year brought me this to bear, and no one came to comfort me. Yet for her grief, Gudrun could not weep. So heart, hard was her heart by the hero's body. Then one wiser than the rest lifts the shroud from the dead. She laid his well-loved head on the knees of his wife. Look on him thou loved and press thy lips to his as if he were, as he still were living. Only once did Gudrun look. She saw his hair all clotted with blood, his blinded eyes that had been so bright. Then she bent and bowed her head, and her tears ran down like drops of rain. Such are the early Norse stories. Man is born to sorrow as the sparks fly upward. To live is to suffer, and the only solution of the problem of life is to suffer with courage. Sigurd, on the way to Brynhild the first time, meets a wise man and asks him 
what his fate will be. Hide nothing from me, however hard, the wise man answers. Thou knowest that I will not lie. Never shalt thou be stained by baseness. Yet a day of doom shall come upon thee, a day of wrath and a day of anguish. But ever remember, ruler of men, the, that fortune lies in the hero's life, and a nobler man shall never live beneath the sun than Sigurd. But yeah, we'll go ahead and end this episode there. As that ends that particular chapter, and the next chapter is the Norse gods. So we'll get another look at the Norse gods a little more in depth than we did in the prose eddas, perhaps. And that will be the last chapter of the book. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Although there will be the uh, ancest the pages of the ancestry, but yeah. So little by little we're getting done here. Yeah. Oh, goodness. It is interesting how similar, but how different the Norse and the Greek mythologies are. Which... I'll have to play the God of War games since the originals dealt with Greek mythology and the sequels uh, dealt with Norse mythology. So yeah. Although I noticed in some of the videos I've watched of the games they had um, Oh, goodness. What's her name as the wife of Odin, which she was not Freya. Freya was not Odin's wife. They messed up on that. I know that's often been confused at times, so they're not the first to do so. But, yeah. Frigg is supposed to be Odin's wife. Oh, goodness. But Freya's overall probably more important in Norse mythology. Kind of the way Aphrodite is the more well-known uh, goddess, or Athena. Even though Hera is technically queen of the Greek gods. But yeah. So, next episode hopefully will be the last. It's about 12 pages long, and like I said, then there's the um, family trees, which adds about another 7, 8, so it'll probably be a fairly decent sized episode, but hopefully it should be the last for this book, because there's nothing else really after that. Index, notes, yeah. But, then, we'll jump on to another mythology. Probably, I think it'll probably be the Bhagavad Gita that we'll be heading to next. Indian mythology. 
It's the only Indian mythology book I have. But yeah. We'll, we'll delve into that a bit. And of course, it's in the Bhagavad Gita, the famous line uh, Oppenheimer says after he sees the atomic bomb's first test. He says, Whoa, and I have become death, destroyer of worlds. So that's one of the, perhaps the most famous part of that book, but yeah. But with that done, let's go ahead and end this episode. As always, educate thyself, think, read, study, learn. Someone tells you something you have trouble believing, ask them to cite their sources. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all in the next one. Until then, later.